Emma, thank you very much for accepting um, my paper today. I'll stand to the side. Ooh, I'll try not to knock everything off the table. Um, I have a lot of slides, um, but they're just really sort of illustrative as much as anything else. So I will be rattling through slides quite quickly, so um, apologies for that. I'm going to talk to you about the Rediscovering the Antonine Wall project, which has started this year. Um, my two co-authors, Patricia and, and Emma, are actually right now this minute doing a community engagement activity relating to the project. Now, it grew out of the management plan for the wall. Those of you familiar with World Heritage Sites will know that we have to have management plans for World Heritage Sites. And the most recent management plan actually talked about engagement with the communities living along the wall. So in a series of projects which as activities, we ultimately managed to raise £2.2 .2 million, which I would give you in euros, but with the exchange rate <laughs> thanks to Brexit, probably about €2.2 .2 million euros at the moment. Um, the principal sources is the National Lottery Heritage Fund, but we've also got money from LIDA and the landfill tax sources. But also we have six partners on the wall and we're all putting funds in. For those of you that don't know where we are, we are north of Hadrian's Wall, which is also a challenge for us because Hadrian's Wall is so frequently presented in the media as the limit of the Romans in Britain. And the Antonine Wall itself actually runs between, it's effectively just west of Edinburgh to the north side of Glasgow. It runs through five local authorities and it's managed by those five local authorities. And that's our first challenge is actually any project that we run with our partners has to benefit each community equally, despite the fact that you will see from this that more of the wall runs through Falkirk than actually anywhere else. So we're all sort of working on ways in which we can actually make sure everybody benefits. Our second challenge is that the sites that we have along the wall are very diverse and only some sections are accessible. Um, we manage quite a few of them within Historic Environment Scotland, with a state agency in Scotland, and the local authorities manage others. They're all open access. Um, some of them require a bit of a walk up a steep hill. Um, we've been up to updating the interpretation recently, although last month, sadly, a whole load of it was um, heavily vandalised and is now being replaced, which is rather um, disappointed and reflects some of the challenge. And our last challenge is that the wall runs through some of the most deprived communities in Scotland, so many of these communities are not engaged at all with the wall, even though it's on their doorstep. And many areas suffer from a lack of amenities and the need for regeneration. Just to say that the SIMD, which is referred to here, is the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation, which measures income, employment, health, education, skills and training, housing, geographic access and crime. And um, you will see here that actually one of our target areas um, is actually... Um, very, it's the 25th most deprived neighbourhood in Scotland. So we began the project by running a series of workshops um, across, across the communities and we asked them what they wanted. This has to be co-designed and co-curated with them. We haven't done this as a tourism initiative, we've done this as things that the local communities want to see. We also ran a community conference last year for the first time, which was absolutely staled out. It was full, we got rid of all the tickets, it was free, and they also got a free lunch, which may have been part of the reason why it was so, <laughs> so busy, but we're running another one again in a couple of, couple of weeks' time, and the plan is to move that again around to a different local authority every year. In terms of timescales, um, the project manager started a couple of years ago because she's done all the development work, but the bulk of the project has started this year, the recruitment started, and we've front-loaded capital projects. Two reasons for that. One is to actually have a maximum impact in year one so that the project is visible. And the second reason is that um, some of the funding is coming from LIDA. And um, those of you will know that that's also Brexit related. Um, that's the project team. Emma, who's one of my co-authors of this paper, is on the left. And that's the two project officers. And we also have the wonderful Maximus Minimus, who helps us with our social media. And, and he, he was named as a result of a, um, of a social media vote. So what does it mean? How are we going to benefit communities? What are we, how are we making our Roman heritage matter? Well, we've got two very important capital strands. The first is play parks, which is my favourite one. Um, and there's also distance labs, which the researcher in me rather likes as well. And we've also then got another 30 co-designed community projects. If anyone's interested in any of this, there's a lot of information online and social media, so we can get more of that. And then we've also got um, a volunteer programme called the 21st Century Legion. So I'll quickly run through 
what these are. The Roman themed play facility, facilities um, is actually something that we, we worked on with our consultants and they've all been designed, we've got five coming, they've all been designed with the local school children. So they've said what they wanted to see. And some of them are more ambitious than others. The first one has opened, the second one is on site and building at the moment. And that's the location of them. So you can see that there's a level of spread out. No, so the, uh, the two in the west is partly because of the nature of where the local authorities fall. But again, it's the local authorities that have selected where they're going to go. And it will be possible for me to take my children on a play park trail. And I have requested that all the slides are big enough for adult female bottoms. So, yeah. So if any of them aren't, there'll be words. Um, this is the most ambitious one. They've got half the money raised through this project. They're having to raise additional funds. It's going to regenerate um, a quarry site. Um, and they're actually building the whole thing into the master planning for the local area. So they're looking at sustainable transport and educational opportunities. And as you will see, it should be encompassing a Roman fort and an Iron Age village all in one play park. This is the one I'm very excited about. First one that opened... I haven't managed to go on it yet because it was too popular with the kids. So I'm going to have to, now they're all back at school, I'm going to have to go and give that a go. That was the opening. It was stout out, um, tremendously popular. Um, and we've got different themes on this one. This one is actually attack and defence. We've got bouncy pits, defensive pits that were trampolines on them you can bounce on. So that's actually my two co-authors trying them out. Um, and, uh, and this one's... It's, it's been incredibly well received, um, as you can see, and uh, I think the local community are already very proud of it. And it's actually probably 100 metres from the Antonine Wall. The next big capital project is replica distance slabs. These are these, the stone monuments that we have, the stone, um, they record the bits of the wall that were uh, done by the particular legions at particular times. They've got some really quite... Um, iconographic imagery, as you can see here. This replica was done by the local community seven years ago, and it's been so successful that everyone else has basically done a we want one. So we're going to do one per council. Again, this is the location of them. Um, and another thing that we're, that we're also doing with the local community is they've asked for sort of aspects of sculpture trails and other things that actually remind people, particularly in areas where the wall is not visible, there's nothing to see, even though we know it's it's under the ground. And so these are some of the ideas and projects that they're wanting to do in terms of sculptures in the landscape. Now, I will say that as much as we can, this is all backed up by academic research. Obviously, there's a bit of uh, um, artistic license taken with play parks. But in terms of the distant stones, um, we funded postdoctoral work by Dr. Louisa Campbell at Glasgow. And she's been looking at the paints and pigmentation on the stones so that we have the potential to do digital full color replicas of these things because she has been detecting what I refer to as 50 shades of red, but she has actually been giving us a color palette that we can start to use for this. And these colored digital versions are being sort of worked up in collaboration with students from the city of Glasgow College, who we ran a design competition with them, um, with their computing department, and there'll be further collaboration with them with their stone masonry courses to actually create the replicas. We've got a 21st century legion where we recruit volunteers, train them up. There'll be researchers, tour guides and ambassadors who are based in the local communities who can then act as advocates and provide information about the wall locally. And the first group has had its first set of training, but also the funding that we have from LIDA is going to allow us to take some of them to visit partner sites in Hadrian's Wall and on the German Limes. So that's all going to happen, um, hopefully, in um, early 2020. In the 1950s and 60s, there was a, um, a rather entertaining wall, wall, wall walk film that was done by the late Professor Annie Robertson. And it features two men, a black and white film, in suits, walking the length of the wall. It's an interesting social commentary on the time, um, particularly as these guys are constantly in the same outfits, climbing over fences in tweed suits. Um, but we're actually going to recreate that with the local commun community, and we'll be, you'll be able to compare it and just see how much the landscape has changed in that 60-year period. We've got creative writing workshops happening with the communities which is actually then going to explore what it actually means to contemporary users. 
And in this, we're wanting to explore aspects of identity, of memory, of belonging. And one of the things that we're looking at, for example, is we've got Syrians stationed on the Antonine Wall. We have Syrian refugees and asylum seekers housed in the communities along the wall. So what is the modern response? How can we use this to engage them on what the wall might mean? We've got a range of schools resources that have been built into the project. Um, and we're also looking at uh, Gaelic resources because we have a Gaelic, Gaelic schools in the area. And one of the local scout groups is wanting to organise a big Roman camp out. So we've bought our first tent. We already were developing a suite of educational resources anyway. We've got a game, which is a quest style thing called Go Roman. And we've done an app in partnership with colleagues in Bavaria and Austria. And this is that project funded by the Creative Europe programme. Thank you, European Union. Some of us in Britain love you. Um, <laughs> And this project has now completed, but we're still actually finishing off uploading the data. And it also means that visitors to sites in different countries will have a familiarity with the same app platform. And we're wanting to share it with Lima's partners um, across the whole of the Roman frontiers. We're also doing a lot of outreach events. We're not just expecting people to come to us. People, there are places where people do things in their local community, whether it's community days. Um, we took a team to the Glasgow Mila this year and um, so rather than expect people to visit sites which actually lumps and bumps in the ground might be difficult to understand we want to bring the heritage to them to events that they're attending in their local communities and the final overarching strand is actually about developing a touring ex exhibition which is going to include both the history of the wall itself alongside narrative which then fit with the museums to which it's going to tour. Now, north of the Antonine Wall, Roman remains become much more ephemeral, but there are still collections in museums that can tell important stories about Roman campaigning and trading. So we want to work with these museums to develop a touring project in the final year of the project that will showcase these stories. Now, the co-designed and co-curated element of the project is 30 projects which are taking place along the length. And these have been proposed by the communities themselves. Not all are fully scoped yet, but I'll give you a flavour of the breadth of some of the ones that are happening. We've got one that's designed to appeal to younger people, which is a murals project in association with a company who specialise in this. And they're looking to bring five international artists to engage with young people, one again for each local authority area. And here's some examples of that company Redcoat have done before. But as well as giving young people the chance to share their responses to the wall, it will then give them a chance to work with these internationally renowned graffiti artists. And then we're intending that the, what they create will be showcased. And here's one that was created at an event we ran at Edinburgh Castle, which was specifically designed at sort of young people up to the age of 24. And so hopefully you can make out perhaps some chariot wheels and odd bits of, of things that have a Roman flavour to them in their response in a sort of colourful and engaging and unique way of interpreting the wall. Moving to the other end of the age spectrum, one of the projects is sponsoring two trishaws, which is piloted by volunteers from a scheme already in existence called Cycling Without Age. And this is specifically looking at residents in local care homes and sheltered housing who might not otherwise be able to get out and about and have the chance to socialise and visit some of the sites. Now, we've had um, trial sessions already, and one of the participants in that hadn't actually left the home that they're in um, for the best part of a year, but has actually now been on the try short twice. At Beers Den, we've got the Bathhouse, which is one of our properties in care, which is as a free-to-access attraction. Um, but the, most of the rest of the site, as you can see from this image here, there's the bathhouse. The rest of the fort is underneath um, the modern urban development of, of uh, Beers Den. But the Baptist church across the road were looking at how they could further develop as a community space. And they're now actually developing specific aspects around mosaics based on the dietary evidence that came from the toilet from the bathhouse. So again, it's grounded in um, academic research. And they're looking at ways to enable schools, tourists, local community to enjoy the gardens, but also then enjoy aspects of their Roman heritage. At the very west end of the wall in Old Kilpatrick, they wanted to develop an arboretum. 
So we're working with Forestry Commission Scotland on a planting scheme for a, 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 an available area of ground, which is going to have seating and entrance installation, and it's going to be consistent as much as we can with Roman and Scottish heritage in terms of the plantation. And the board here just shows some of the community consultation and what people have been asking for. Drum Chapel in Glasgow is one of the most deprived sites covered by the project, but it is one where there is an active and engaged community. So we've linked up with a local arts community on a sculpture trail, which is going to focus on Roman altars. It's going to mix Roman heritage, social history, local stories and natural history to tell a narrative on a walking route around the area. And needless to say, the local community deliberately asked for stone because a wooden bench previously had been targeted by vandals and burnt. But it will also take in the play park sites that will link across these projects. And then Lamb Hill, which is another um, deprived area of Glasgow. Um, and there's also looking at a community which is working with its local residents. And they're looking at developing a community gardens at the rear of the site to run that. And again, we're going to, this is where one of the Roman distance slabs, distance zones is going to be sited. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, we're hoping to work specifically with asylum seekers and refugees who've relocated to the wall to better understand their stories and weeding them into a wider narrative. And because of the, um, the diverse nature of, of the Romans, the mobility and the society, the fact that we know there were families moving in with the wall and moving, people moving around the empire, we know we've got a regiment from Syria here, we've got evidence of soldiers from North Africa as well as across other large parts of modern day Europe. So we're hoping to explore some of these stories and experiences with these contemporary and diverse communities living near the site today. That's a rattle through. For those of you on social media, we have a website. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Please follow us and find out more. Thank you.